it's great to be here and it's really great to be in Seattle um, in particular. Um, great to be here in Seattle for me personally, um, not because I, I grew up here, but Seattle nonetheless played a big role in my own adolescence um, as a music obsessed teenager in the uh, early 1990s. Uh, my eyes and ears were firmly on the Seattle music scene. Does anyone here remember grunge music? All right, Gen X is still in the building. So um, indeed, you know, one of the, the most important questions it seemed among my peers in the early 1990s in our sort of sheltered suburban life in the suburbs of Washington, DC was who's better Nirvana or Pearl Jam? Um, now, of course, I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm in midlife, well into my 40s, but I can still recite lyrics from dozens of songs from back then. And I've tried my best to turn my kids on to the glory of 90s alternative rock. And yet, and yet, true to form, um, my five-year-old son Ezra recently settled my high school debate about the best Seattle music act by picking a different early 90s Seattle act altogether. Um, so, um, now your girlfriend rolls a Honda. Um, so, uh, so what does this have to do with JDAI? Well, JDAI is also in midlife. What started out in the early 1990s as a radical for its time reform campaign has grown up. JDI has become mainstream. And like all of us who've left adolescence behind, it faces a continuing challenge to retain its focus, its clarity of purpose. I had this challenge in mind when I decided to focus this morning's talk on a simple question that hits me every day. What is JDI these days and what does it stand for? Now this question might seem painfully obvious to you. After all, you've traveled hundreds or thousands of miles to come to the JDI conference, and you probably feel like you've got a good handle on this thing. But I actually don't think it's that straightforward. So with an assist from my colleague, Beth Oprish, we sought input from experienced JDI uh, members of the network, and here is what they said to that question. JDI is about equity and doing the best for kids. Uh, so JDAI is essentially a nationwide effort uh, to address the underlying needs that you have in response to their behavior as opposed to locking them up. JDAI is a collaborative group that works to reform the juvenile justice system. JDAI has been an opportunity to open up new avenues to serve our youth and family in a more meaningful way. JDAI is system reform that works because it's sustainable. JDAI is a commitment to supporting youth and families at home in their communities. JDAI is a place of connection, a place where you can learn about juvenile justice and a place where providers can really come and connect. JDAI is never accepting the status quo, but always seeing the potential in kids. We're looking for alternatives in the community that we can provide opportunities for our youth and families through this whole juvenile justice reform. JDAI is talented people doing great work on behalf of children and families to have better opportunities, period. And, you know, look, all of these are, are good answers. They're the, they're the right answers. And I'm gratified that JDAI is still seen as vital and valuable, but the answers are all different as well. And watching these clips, it struck me that it might be beneficial if I talked about JDAI's focus and its future. Now, the first thing to recognize is that these questions, what is JDAI and what does it stand for, used to be pretty straightforward back in the days of JDAI's adolescence. Like, for example, back in 2006, when I was a mid-level manager at DC's Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, and I attended my first uh, JDI Intersight Conference in New Orleans, I had a fantastic time. It was my first big work trip since entering the juvenile justice field, and I brought home lasting memories. Um, dancing with my new friend Jim Payne down Bourbon Street, um, touring the Ninth Ward, uh, learning about her New Orleans' heroic efforts to recover after Hurricane Katrina, and most of all, meeting all of these great JDI people who were just as committed to meaningful juvenile justice reform as I was. 
Now for me as a relative newbie to the national juvenile justice stage, it was heady stuff. But looking back, it was a much, much simpler time for our initiative when everyone knew what we were trying to accomplish. You know, the focus was squarely on detention reform and the eight core strategies of JDAI. The JDI network was, was seeing geometric growth around the country as we kept adding new sites at that time. Also because the network was much smaller, the foundation had resources to provide funding and technical assistance to almost every JDAI site in the network. And most were able to go on model site visits to Albuquerque and Portland and Chicago and Santa Cruz. And finally, sites were reporting fantastic outcomes in reducing detention utilization without any harm to public safety. Today, 13 years later, detention utilization continues to drop. For the first time in our initiative, average daily population across the entire network is down by 50% from the baseline. Admissions are down 57%. Commitments to state custody are down 63%. All great accomplishments, right? But JDAI looks very different. If you spend time on JDI Connect lately, or as Gail said, if you looked at the agenda for this conference, you know that JDI no longer devotes all or even most of its attention to detention reform. This network is still kicking butt and taking names, but you're doing so in a wide variety of ways in many phases of the juvenile justice system. Now, just a few examples here. Since being named a model site nearly 20 years ago, Santa Cruz has never stopped pushing the reform envelope. Through a succession of four probation chiefs, Santa Cruz has developed ambitious strategies to support and engage youth, partner with community on positive youth development, provide culturally responsive wraparound care for kids with mental health and social service needs, and do everything in its power to keep young people at home. Indeed, for a recent nine month span, Santa Cruz County didn't send a single young person to out of home placement. With support from Casey, New York City's probation department developed a template for an entirely new family, uh, family engaged case planning process that shifts probation's focus away from compliance and toward collaborative goal setting with parents and young people themselves. New York City has invested in a wide array of placement alternatives and has slashed the number of youth in placement by 80% in the last decade. And youth, youth in placement are no longer sent to upstate youth prisons, but are rather are housed in small residential facilities in or adjacent to New York City. In Washington, DC, where I first worked in the system, the primary focus of the Youth Corrections Agency a decade ago was shutting down a decrepit and dangerous 188 bed youth prison and standing up a developmentally appropriate 60 bed facility in its place. Today, even that new facility is practically empty with fewer than 10 adjudicated youth there per day. Yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, dozens of young people committed to agency custody are living at home, supported by a dedicated mentor known as a credible messenger with roots in the community and personal experience in the justice system. You're going to hear from one of the leaders of the credible messenger effort in DC, Antonio Fernandez, later this morning. Now these examples and dozens and dozens of others around our network are exciting. But at the same time, I can see how this diverse reform activity has left room for confusion about JDI's core focus. So let me bring it all together. When I ask the question, what is JDI today? I really wanna talk about three things, okay? The first is what is our focus? The second is how do we operate as a network? And the third is what are the shared values that drive us? With respect to focus, let's recognize that for many years now, JDAI has been about a lot more than detention reform. Indeed, that has always been the plan. Casey conceived of JDAI as an entry point strategy. If we could approve, if we could prove that applying reason, logic and innovation to this one phase of the juvenile justice system to reduce confinement would work, then the lessons learned would naturally spill out to all the other phases of the justice system as well. In fact, way back in 2007, we released a report, a JDI Pathways report called Beyond Attention. It described how JDI sites then were already leveraging their JDI success in other aspects of the system. And it makes all the sense of the world 
right? Once you learn to use data, to collaborate, to develop alternatives to confinement, it would be crazy to do these things only for detention and not in the rest of the system as well. And this push to expand JDI's focus beyond detention is primarily being driven by your, your um, interests, not Casey's insistence. For instance, of the 186 workshop ideas we received for this conference, and yes, we received, well, let me just applaud that. We received 186 workshop ideas for this conference. <clears throat> um, just 20% focused specifically on detention reform. Likewise, when we created a new process this spring for sites to request direct assistance from the Casey Foundation, only about a third of the proposals we received had to do with detention. Thus far at Casey, our non-detention work with JDI sites has focused really in two main areas and two related areas, deep end reform and probation transformation. So let me fill you in on the progress that your colleagues have been making in this work. Now, starting with a cohort of sites in 2013 and then expanding to a second cohort in 2015, the 11 deep end sites have sought to safely and significantly reduce out of home placement, not just state commitments, but all out of home placements, especially among youth of color. These sites recognize that it was time to raise the bar, time to pilot a new approach with a higher ambition. And while the site's work is ongoing, they have produced early evidence that jurisdictions can safely and significantly reduce their reliance on out-of-home placements and achieve more equitable results with deliberate efforts and specific targets. Even in a time around the country when correctional populations are shrinking everywhere, results in our deep end sites have been especially impressive. Across the board, sites have cut their placement rates by 52% from their baseline years of 2012 and 2014. Again, not just state commitments, but all out of home placements. More notably, fully 80% of the drop has been among youth of color, as more than half of the sites have made notable progress narrowing long-standing stand, long racial disparities that plague their juvenile justice systems. And these sites are demonstrating that an intentional focus on youth of color is having an impact beyond youth of color. Take, for example, Ramsey County, Minnesota, Five years ago, black youth in Ramsey County were 25 times more likely than their white peers to be sent to an out-of-home placement. By 2018, that gap has shrunk by more than half with a huge impact on the system as a whole. For example, back in 2015, Ramsey County was poised to build a large residential facility. By 2017, they had abandoned those plans, instead investing $500,000 a year into community-based supports instead. And then this year, just a few years removed from plans to build a new facility, they closed a long-standing facility that they've had and operated for years. And it's not, it's not just Ramsey County. St. Louis City has cut its placement rate by 76%. They've done it by leaning into their strengths. And as my colleague Gail D would say, exercising new muscles as well. In partnership with Better Family Life, who you heard about last night, St. Louis has created a new team support approach that empowers families and young people like never before. A system that already had strong leadership and analytical chops, St. Louis looked to families and grassroots community partners to take the next step. Now, these are only two examples, two of many that I could report around the deep end sites. But what's important to understand is across all of the sites, we have seen a determination to more deliberately focus on race, to partner with families and to collaborate with community partners. And then there's probation. Last year, the Casey Foundation released Transforming Juvenile Probation, a vision for getting it right. The report had two main findings. First, as a country, we overuse probation. It's the disposition for more than 60% of adjudicated youth nationwide and hundreds of thousands of other young people are on informal probation caseloads. This includes many young people with minor offenses or who are deemed low risk for reoffending. Also, young people are on probation who are there due to unaddressed social and human service needs that are best and most fairly addressed outside of the justice system. In short, we give probation to everyone. Right? Kids with first time misdemeanors, kids with fifth felonies, those deemed low risk, those deemed high risk, old kids, new kids, green kids, blue kids, it doesn't matter, we give them probation. Right? Our second key finding was that probation's traditional surveillance and compliance model is fundamentally misguided. All available research 
tells us that probation, the traditional way, simply doesn't work, and that it's actually harmful for young people who are low risk for rearrest. We also found that many common practices in probation contradict the evidence on adolescent development and what works in reversing delinquent conduct. And based on these findings, we had two main recommendations. The transformation had two main pillars that we want to talk about. First, sharply reduce the number of youth placed on probation in the first place by diverting a greater share of young people and allowing community, not the courts, to address their misbehavior. And second, for young people who do get placed on supervision, we need to reorient probation away from rule compliance and make it about behavior change and long-term success. This is not just tinkering around the edges and adding new pieces, it's a top to bottom overhaul. Now, what does reimagining or reinventing or reorienting probation mean? It means individualized plans developed with youth and families instead of a laundry list of probation conditions. It means focus on positive youth development rather than primarily addressing problems and deficits. It means see seeing advancing equity as core to the purpose of probation. And it means using positive rewards and incentives rather than sanctions. To be clear, we don't mean what we sometimes see of squeezing a little bit of like the incentive ketchup on top of a half pound sanctions burger. We're talking about changing the meal entirely. C incentives has to be the meal. Now, we've had a big response to this report, more than any other publication that we've released in recent years. And I'm pleased to report that numerous jurisdictions are already implementing key pieces of the probation transformation agenda. Ohio has made juvenile probation a state priority, right? Requiring counties to pursue transformation and staging in-depth training sessions for probation staff across the state. Some KC deep end sites are being trained on our new family engaged case planning model, which will be the focus of a, a practice guide that'll be released later this year. And we've had strong interest in a new probation certificate transformation certificate program that we'll be offering in partnership with the Georgetown Center for Juvenile Justice Reform just next month. Now, when it comes to putting probation in practice, the most impressive work is taking place just down the road from here in Pierce County, Washington. Pierce has devised an entirely new approach called opportunity-based probation, which seeks to influence young people's behavior and promote their success through positive incentives rather than the threat of punishment for violating probation rules. All of this based on the adolescent brain research. As part of its commitment, not just to address disparities, but to actually become an anti-racist organization, Pierce County's Juvenile Court has recreated an enhanced program, Pathways to Success, for younger African-American boys on its probation caseload. Pierce has created a family advisory council and taken other steps to ensure that family members of court-involved youth are fully engaged in their children's cases. It has also forged partnerships with more than a dozen community organizations to engage court-involved young people in constructive activities. I had the privilege to be in Pierce County a few weeks ago, and the commitment to probation transformation is evident and infectious. You feel it walking down the hallways of probation. You feel it amongst their community providers. Now, again, through all of this, all of this with probation, it's only the first step, right? It's only half the challenge because equally important is to decrease the probation population itself by expanding the use of diversion. Despite all the research that shows us that young people do better when they're kept out of the justice system entirely, and despite the promise of restorative justice approaches like Seema Gajwani will talk to us about this morning, the share of referred youth nationwide who get diversion hasn't changed in a generation, two generations. Many other advanced nations around the world divert nearly th three quarters or more of young people apprehended for delinquent conduct. But here in the United States, we never cracked the 45% barrier. Fortunately, momentum is at last building to increase the use of diversion in the United States. Several states in recent years, including Kansas, Kentucky, South Dakota, West Virginia, have passed reform laws that significantly expand the use of diversion. Meanwhile, the largest county in the country, Los Angeles County, has approved plans and allocated tens of millions of dollars to support an ambitious plan that aims to divert up to 80% of all youth apprehended for delinquent conduct. Not only will these youth avoid court, they will be diverted prior to arrest, so they won't have any record whatsoever. Yes. You know, we're early on in this diversion work, but we stand ready to work with anyone who is looking for this type of community-centered approach. 
Now, of course, we know that deep end, probation, diversion, they're only some of the new directions that you're interested in pursuing and that, we, and that we've experienced. There are many more you'll see re reflected on the conference agenda, like positive youth development, about which teams from 15 jurisdictions received training as part of the Reimagining Juvenile, uh, Re Juvenile Justice Train the Trainer Initiative led by the School in Maine Institute. The RJJ trainers are now collectively training close to 400 staff back in their home jurisdictions. Like family and youth engagement, which many sites have been delving into with support from partners like Justice for Families and JJSG's Youth Advisory Council. You'll hear this, more, this afternoon from Jarrell Daniels, one of our Youth Advisory Council members, who's demonstrating how system-involved youth can't just have, not only have a voice, but can actually shape public policy. And ending the youth prison model, which doesn't just mean closing facilities, but elevating the standard of care for all young people exposed to out-of-home placement You'll hear today from James McCleary of the Inside Circle Foundation about the importance of healing for young people who are in these places, especially those who have some of the most serious offense histories. Now, at this point, you may be wondering where detention fits into all of this, right? That's what brought us together in the first place, right? And I'll say this, whatever else changes about JDAI, we expect that you will never take your foot off the gas pedal when it comes to minimizing the use of detention or maybe to switch the, the metaphor that you'll never stop slamming on the brakes to stop young people from entering detention. Detention reform is as important now as it ever was, but how we operate as a network is evolving. It's changing, I think, in two important ways. The first is that these days, members of the JDI network are more connected than ever before and can accomplish more than ever without direct support from the Andy Casey Foundation. Thanks to our online JDI Connect platform, you have more, more access to information, more avenues to find support, more opportunity to share ideas and brainstorm solutions among your peers than at any time in our initiative's history. Big thanks to our colleagues at the Pretrial Justice Institute who have uh, launched a major upgrade of JDI Connect this week. So I hope all of you will go on the platform and you'll see what it looks like. It looks a little different than what it did just a week ago. Now we launched JDI Connect two years ago at our last JDI Intersight Conference. We did so because as we saw it, JDAI was this remarkable collection of people and places committed to reform, but you were largely disconnected from one another. And the communication flow was entirely one way from the foundation out to you. If you had a question, your only options were to search the old JDI help desk for documents or call your technical assistance team leader and tap into their expertise. Today, through JDI Connect, you have access to 3,000 JDI Network colleagues. You can post a question online, read blog posts, participate in webinars, enroll in a Fundamentals of JDI training, like last month where 44 participants across 13 counties or 13 states in this network did. But it's more than that. JDI Connect offers a space to engage with your peers in other sites and compare notes and explore new approaches. Like the communities of practice we started, where JDI Network members are coming together to dive deep into topics that you as a network selected and which are already helping sites up their game. For example, based on what they learned in the LGBTQ community of practice, leaders in Johnson County, Kansas, began collecting SOGI data on all youth and they upgraded their staff training curriculum on LGBTQ youth and issues. Leaders in Dallas County, Texas, reported that thanks in part to their participation in the case processing continuing a community of practice, they've cut the average time that young people await placement by more than two weeks. My excitement here, just to be clear, is less about the technology. I have no idea how JDI Connect works in the, in the background, right? It's not about the technology at all. It's that JDI Connect is a tool for our community to come together and to support one another. Our JDI coordinators, always the lifeblood of this initiative, have a lively space where they come together on JDI Connect, where they ask each other questions and support one another as do our Applied Leadership Network alumni who are eager to offer their assistance and their expertise to the network as a whole. On a bigger scale, we were gratified and inspired to see nearly a thousand people in our network participate last fall in the 21 day equity habit building challenge led by the members of our Applied Leadership Network. This year's demystifying data challenge had 4,500 page views to date. And all of this is just the beginning I feel like in some ways, this, from this ground up approach, we're just scratching the surface. You know, we're, we think about it, we live in a world today 
when a 15 year old Swedish girl can kick off a global protest movement to combat climate change, when an NFL quarterback can spark a nationwide conversation about policing and race, when activists can launch a movement like Black Lives Matter that shifts Americans' perspectives on the justice system. We live in a time when change can come from anywhere, led by anyone with the vision and the audacity to share their voice. I'm eager to see the same thing take hold within our network here. And that leads me to the second shift that I wanna talk about. In light of emerging research, I think it's time for all JDI sites to take a fresh look at their detention reform efforts and rethink their purpose of detention. Right kid, right place, right time has been the motto of detention reform since JDI's early days. This motto was necessary in the 1990s when youth crime and violence were front page news. And the formulation was also instrumental over the next day, decade in helping us expand JDI and, and build the network. It made the idea of detention reform palatable to a lot of system leaders who might otherwise have been skeptical. But in light of what we know about the impact of detention on young people and the continued racial disparities that define juvenile detention across this country, I fear that the motto, right kid, right place, right time, has outlived its usefulness. Emerging research shows that detention causes serious and lasting harm. Indeed, a soon to be released study right here in Washington state found that every day a young person is in detention was associated with a 3% increase in the likelihood of a new delinquency referral. Think about that for a second. Each day, we say every day matters. Even more powerful evidence came from a longitudinal study involving more than 35,000 youth in the Chicago area. After controlling for young people's offenses and backgrounds, it found that spending time locked in detention reduced the likelihood of graduating high school by 13% and the likelihood of adult incarceration increased by 22%. I worry, I worry that the right kid, right place, right time mentality has kept us too comfortable with detaining kids. With this motto, detention remains just another option on the menu, appropriate for any young person who scores high on a screening tool or otherwise raises concerns. You know, a new day has arrived and justice reform is having its moment. Earlier this year, San Francisco's Board of Supervisors voted to close their county's 150 bed detention center, not reduce the population. Thank you. Not reduce the population, not close a wing, but shut it down entirely. And the vote was 10 to one. Here in King County, the county executive has embedded support for a zero youth detention campaign in the county government. I'm really excited about this effort because the very formulation signals that detention should never be normal or routine. Rather, our systems must explore every option possible before we can find young people and only do it in extraordinary cases. I think that's an ideal that everyone here, everyone in our network should take to heart. Please take a look back at your purpose of detention statement. Is your jurisdiction still treating detention as a standard option for young people? Is your detention center still housing young people who do not pose an immediate risk of safety to their neighbors? Could they be supported safely in the community? You know, when JDAI began 25 years ago, it, the onus was on reformers like us to justify keeping young people out of detention. I see King County's zero youth detention effort as a confirmation that this situation has flipped 180 degrees, right? Now the onus is on us to justify why any young person should be locked up. Thank you. There may well be situations when detention is required, but it should never be an easy decision. Now, I, I recognize that the zero youth detention idea might make me making some people's head spins, and thank you for not throwing anything at me on the stage here today. But, you know, it reminds me of a joke that George Carlin once told. Have you ever noticed that anyone driving slower than you is an idiot and anyone driving faster than you is a maniac? That's sort of, you know, justice reform today, I feel like in, in, in a nutshell. But in that spirit, I say that it's entirely okay if not everyone in this room is comfortable with setting a zero detention goal. But 
I do hope that all of you will recognize the benefits that the pursuit of zero detention can have as a catalyst for asking questions and seeking reforms up and down the youth justice system in all phases. I mean, look at the five core objectives of King County's roadmap for zero youth detention. Lead with racial equity, prevent young people from entering the system, divert them from further system involvement, support system involved youth and their families with community centered resources and align and optimize connections across systems. You know, what started out here by activists as a movement against something, the detention of youth, instead transformed itself into something else entirely. And frankly, something more important. It's a platform for creating something new, something better that not only limits the use of confinement, but aims to promote young people's success and well being. And that is something that I hope that everyone here in the JDI network is committed to doing. Are we asking these kind of questions? Are we connecting young people to resources and, and opportunities in their communities? Are we helping them address and overcome trauma? Are we providing them with opportunities to contribute to their communities, repair the harms that they have caused and develop leadership skills? Are we tapping into their expertise and their passions by providing young people with opportunities to raise their voices and help guide the youth justice system itself? Now, I've covered, I've covered a lot of ground in, in this speech this morning. And as I near my, my, the end of my time with you, let me try to boil all this down. Um, in the simplest terms, JDAI is you. JDAI is you in this room and all of your peers back home who couldn't be here with us today. You are a network of reformers who are dedicated to improving all aspects of your youth justice system. And you, or really I should say we, are a network bound together by a shared set of values around the kind of justice system we want for our youth and our communities. Which leads to the question, what does JDAI stand for these days? What are those values that join us together as a network and animate our work together? I think about it this way. We are a network committed to ensuring that every child, every day, experience a youth justice system that is just in the sense that it is committed to racial and ethnic equity and fairness to girls and LGBTQ youth, that it's developmentally appropriate in the sense that the system seeks to divert as many young people as possible, transform probation, minimize confinement. And when young people are confined, ensure that facilities are safe, dignifying, healing, and well-designed to help young people grow and mature. That we're accountable in the sense that from police to courts, to probation, to corrections agencies, we grown-ups are accountable to the young people, families, and communities we serve. We're accountable for following best practices and achieving positive outcomes and accountable for advancing equity, even when the root causes driving disparities feel out of our control. And finally, that we're inclusive in the sense that system professionals recognize the strengths and critical importance of families and make them full partners in their children's cases. That we work with community partners to connect youth with a rich array of positive youth development opportunities. And we sure ensure that these family and community partnerships are robust for youth of all races and ethnicities. This is the JDAI that I envision. Now, before I exit the stage this morning, I wanna to return to where I started. Yes, the Seattle music heroes of my adolescence. Those bands took the world by storm back in those days. They made a huge impression on me and countless other kids of my generation. Now, unfortunately, when I look back at them today, it's obvious that their fame was fleeting and their long-term influence was pretty modest. In some ways, JDAI's story resembles the grunge movement. We both came out of nowhere and took the nation by storm. I mean, it's still kind of unbelievable that at a, as a reform concept that was launched as a pilot project in five cities around the country has taken fire like this and is all, all around the country in hundreds of communities around the country. And, has be, and redefined what best practices are for the juvenile justice system. It's an amazing accomplishment. What's different is that unlike the grunge scene, JDAI didn't burn out after our moment in the sun. We didn't fade away. Rather, JDI remains just as vital and just as relevant today as ever, maybe more. I 
think JDAI has retained that relevance because it's been allowed to evolve. And looking forward, I think it must continue to evolve. Now the Casey Foundation is determined to help you extend JDI's winning streak. We remain as committed as ever to youth justice reform, and we stand ready to support you in every way that we can. We hope that this conference will be valuable to you, and we look forward to continuing our work together and extending our winning streak for many years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.